fabulous. So we'll be presenting today about this project that has been going on for, I guess, 18, 20 months and has created all sorts of waves of change in the community. So we'll um, get started. There we go. So <laughs> we're off to a good start so far. So let's start with the Truth and Reconciliation Calls for Action. And its call is for employment in the community. Ensure that Aboriginal people have equitable access to jobs, training, and education opportunities. And to do that in remote communities, when I asked youth, and I went to Garden Hill and with Sagamac, and ask them, do the, you want to come to Winnipeg? Do you want to come out to Saskatoon, Thunder Bay, to get your education there? And they're 18 out of 20 in both groups said no. There's too much racism. We have families here. We want to raise our families here. We want, we want to have a positive role in our own communities. And I was floored by that. You know, I'm coming from University of Manitoba, Winnipeg, it's the center. Doesn't everyone want to be there? No, <laughs> it turns out. They want to stay in Garden Hill and with Sagamac and learn there. And so that was a starting point for this um, programming. So we looked at community-led education programs and how to make that happen. And we, I knocked on a lot of doors. I knocked on Red River. I met with them I don't know how many times. Um, lots of colleges, and they felt it was very high risk to work in these communities. So UCN for a while was in there, but as you probably know, if you're off um, provincial territory, if you're on reserve, it's a very different funding structure for, uni for universities and colleges. It's a pay-for-service one, so that it's five times, ten times more expensive to have a program in the community, which is just wrong, because these are the communities that have the needs. As you can see from this graph, this is a graph that Lakeisha Barkman did. This 20-year-old student won top honors for her work, door-to-door -door census, basically, of 384 houses, households in Garden Hill, and she found out that youth have a worse chance of being employed than elders. So nobody's employing youth. This is 15 to 30, and um, you, everything's cut off, but it's 16.4, so 16.5% of youth are employed in the community. So none of these kids are given a chance for a job. So what, what do they have to do in these communities? There's no community centers, there's no uh, uh, adult education centers, there's no uh, colleges, so let's give these guys a chance. And I'm just unfortunate, the slides don't actually look like this, so maybe they can fix them and get them so that they're, um, you can see the whole thing. The other call for action, which was quite a long time ago, but I thought this was really profound and I wanted to read it to you, is the integration of housing objectives, how it interconnects with social and economic activities in Aboriginal communities, and it can provide a synergistic effect, right? We need housing, we need youth employment, bring them together, and you have housing and you have youth employment. Let's fix one need with the other need. It's, it's a no-brainer. Why isn't it happening in every community, right? To prevent gangs, to prevent the problem with drugs, provide positive activities, provide employment, and you're going to see houses, and you're going to see lots of, of positive outcomes. So I want you for a moment to shut your eyes and imagine your community, your First Nation community, and every First Nation community, if you have a community college, a community university that builds houses, that builds also, food capacity, any need in your community that you focus your college 
and actually develop the youth to do and serve the community to meet those needs. Let's have our own communities serving our own communities. So the needs being met through education dollars and employment training dollars. And there you go. That's the Boreal Home Builders Program, uh, which we renamed the Minaba Madison just because we wanted you to learn that word, which means a good life, a practice of a good life. So Minaba Madison and um, partnership. And you know you're successful when somebody tries to steal your name <laughs> and copyright it. So they stole the Boreal Home Builder, so we're working with, and, and we actually think the elders and everyone thinks it's a better, much better title, Mino Bimadison. So we've got the youth working uh, in the communities in Garden Hill and Wasagamac. It's been an 18-month program, and they started with, you know, a job uh, readiness programming, lots of safety programming, wilderness survival, uh, and built up to forest management logging. So they're getting the trees out of the forest to build the houses. And this is meeting a huge need in the community, right? So housing, I used to work in food security. That was my thing. I went, found out horrible food insecurity in communities. And I came again to these communities and said, let's do some food programming. And they said to me, housing. We need housing first. Housing is a big issue. If we don't have a house, we can't make the food. So the program, the partnership dollars we got were towards both housing, housing first, as people said, as the community said, and then food second. But you can see the huge housing issues is more than one person per room. Like these rooms are including kitchens, bathrooms, right? And we have 24 times the national average in Wasagamack and 22 times in Garden Hill. Like severe overcrowding. There are three families. There are four families living in some of these houses. And these are the counselor's houses. There's no family that um, is untouched. The rooms per dwelling, much less, even though there's larger families, so that's the inverse. Major repair needed, 13 times in Wasagamack. So most, almost all the houses need major repairs, right? And not suitable, considered not suitable. So very, very high, very big problems in First Nations reserves, especially the fly-in communities, especially the ones that are under third party for a period of time because they're not given any funding to build new houses. And these are the communities that need it most. So that, that policy has to change. And some of the problems that you've seen a time and time again is moisture problems, moisture from above, so roof leaks, groundwater and soil contamination, moisture from below, Foundation, lots of foundation and structural programs, and what I spoke of is overcrowding. So uh, if you can start the video. For years now, we, we had no sewers or running water. I got eight kids, and I've just been getting water every day by tub at the water pump. I have no ride, I usually just walk. And when I wash them up, I take them down the bank to wash them up, wash their hair and stuff. And swords, I throw out the pail probably twice a day. My son, he has one eye, and it's hard keeping him clean all the time because I have to take him down the bank all the time, and he's scared of the water. Last time it was renovated, we were still living in it, and I guess one of the main beams were just about to fall off. They said my house was about to fall down on, our, on us. I got no worse to live so I can build up my own family. Electricity, half of it doesn't even work. On this side, it doesn't work. On this side, it works. That's all I need is help for me to fix it up. It's not just me that's living like that. Lots of people have lots of kids and 
There's like three families living in one house that doesn't even have running water or sewage too. All over. about that video. Did you get the message that Wasaga Bank needs some houses and there's some major problems? Was that kind of queer? Yeah. So I find though that if, if you don't videotape it, people don't get that message, right? People don't understand who are not from First Nations Reserves. I'll, I'll let you know that Wasaga Bank is out of third party, but most of the communities that are flying get into that situation because there's so many expenses and so, and so much uh, uncertainty with winter roads, right? The ice roads not working, then you're out of, in debt. So they're out of that situation, but for 10 years, what happens if you don't have a house built? What happens to the carpenters? Do you have any carpenters because they have no work? So you might have a red seal carpenter, you might have a red seal um, plumber, electrician, no jobs in the community, they can't work, they can't apprentice, etc., etc. So not only do you not have houses, you don't have tradespeople in these communities, right? And that's a real problem with this policy where houses don't get built if, there's, uh, if they're under third party. Oh. So Lakeisha, when she did her survey, she also asked about water. And where we drink our water, where we make our food, is in the houses. This is our hearth, right? And she found a huge amount of these houses, even after a sewer and water project, were still drinking out of pails. And that's, cisterns are problematic too, but pails mean very high contamination. And... Um, so H. pylora, it's very, very high. So stomach disorders and the resulting Im health impacts are enormous as a result of this. This is worse than any developing country I've been to. 21%. And this is her surveying house to house, 384 houses. So better than Stats Canada. And houses are also where we poop, right? So the fact that there isn't running water means there's no sewage, there's no pipes. And that means you're taking a bucket out. And a horrible story I heard, absolutely horrendous, is uh, in South Indian Lake, they have a pit and they let their little, boy, their little boy ran around for two minutes and he drowned in that sewage pit. So this is an unacceptable state and we, uh, something has to be done about this. So our mission as a partnership is to bring everyone together to uh, build houses, to build homes, really, um, and to have community-led secondary education, post-secondary education. So we're working with universities, we're working with First Nations employment and training is bringing their dollars in and, uh, and actually building them, uh, um, providing the materials, housing is providing the materials, everybody's contributing to this pot. And oh my goodness, how many pots we had to bring together to just make this work. And how many proposals had to be written. So I had funding through my university, the partnership, to fund the students. I could give them training allowances, but I couldn't pay for the program. So we had to apply through the post-secondary, um, the INAC, uh, post-secondary partnership program for that, so that's a third one. And then to get MITIC up and running, 
we had to apply for community futures. So that's just three funds, but four or five more are required. So I'm just saying we have to find easier ways to bring all these pieces together so your communities can have youth building houses. And now I'm going to show you a video about the partnership and hopefully it's going to work and sound good. And be on right we only have uh, like four foot uh, foundation when that freezes it, it's, it, uh, the house warps right my idea is we go right down to the bedrock because I know we have lots of bedrock right because I've been digging around here for forever I have a three bedroom but with, with no drywall all wood piling try to make it as natural as natural as wood as we can make it uh, wood burning stove we'll, we can have it right here at the, at the middle at the little middle of the house for us here like outdoor people right when we get home from a, from a long ride fishing we need a place to warm up right away you know what I mean and, and it's very important that we have a wood stove in case we have a power outage. Stacked corn walls, which is chopping wood to a certain length and using that to stack entire wall systems that is allowed to breathe so the air moves in and out. The interior wall is going to look like this, made out of logs. He's got a floor plan, he's got an outside plan. He's got a structural plan too. Your house, you're talking about your house. saw the pathway this is taking and it's starting in the forest in the boreal and it's uh, well I guess backtrack there is it's starting actually with the design of the houses so it and it really was a program like this where you have paper you have pens and asking people to draw their vision of a house and then discussing it and if I asked you right now to do that how many of you would say you want a wood stove Put up your hand. Okay, how many of you would say you want a big, big center room that can hold, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 people? So to have wakes, etc. So we're getting this feedback, and durability, of course, was a big factor. So um, we started with designs, and it's amazing. You put a pencil in people's hands and all the magic that happens like people who you really don't hear a lot from have these show these great ex examples and ideas so it's a really a magic trick try you know see what what people have to offer and then you go back to them so I, I worked with them over a week and you ask them to include and consider you know where the sun 
uh, you know, looking at passive solar, thinking about the environment, and it just gets better and better and better. And then the idea that they're really, these communities, half First Nations are surrounded by wood. I'd say most First Nations are surrounded by wood, right? So you have local resources there. And there has been a policy of um, ISC not to fund sawmills. So they stopped funding sawmills. And originally when I went to Community Futures, they said, we won't fund that, asking for a loan. Luckily, we were able to go back to a grant and get a grant on it. So I think there has been a bit of a shift. Uh, they're looking at Wasagamac to see how this can be done. Right, but if the money from rec reconciliation from residential school, what are people buying in the communities? And they're all buying, not all buying, but there are, they are buying wood misers. This is what community wants and government has to listen to that, right? So I don't know, Garden Hill has about four or five. I know Larry has his own personal sawmill. There's quite a few sawmills in Wasagamac, but little ones and we need to scale up, right? So the infrastructure sawmill, and that's Larry's piece. The, he's our superhero on um, make project management and building a business. And the construction, um, Daryl will talk about. So he's working with the youth and managing youth to build the housing, the first version of the housing. And then the knowledge ex exchange Rihanna will talk about is how we can work with the universities who have all these great architects and um, and all sorts of, of educators and community developers to make things happen to help make things happen so it's considering how to design with the community considering family size accessibility cultural practices family preferences resources how can we use local resources and some of that is you know a reuse right because in flying communities things don't go away so how can we reuse uh, the materials in the community and meeting national building codes for cmhc so you can see pictures of old houses or houses in the community, wood houses that were built, beautiful wood houses. And Alex Wilson, who uh, was the person from I Don't Know More, came up and uh, she has a real program around the muskrat hut. And seeing houses as part of a community, not on their own, but requiring infrastructure, right? And so we're working on, and we've developed a proposal to get an emergency shelter. This is a fly-in community that recently had a forest fire and everyone had to fly out, not even fly out, they don't even have an airport, um, boat out and then fly out. And it took many, many, many days is we need emergency shelters. We need good infrastructure in these communities which don't have hospitals, don't have roads, don't have airports, don't have community centers. So. The vision is there, and the elders came out in droves to inspire it, and the youth had all sorts of planning aspects. And uh, everyone can draw their vision of a house, right? So everyone here at this table has ideas that could be put into place, and we have those drawings still on our walls to keep us on track. So out of this came a blueprint. We finally got it engineering stamped, it's a first version, it's not perfect. And the funny thing, it was not funny, that is um, Wasagamac had a fire of all its building materials this summer. So here we were all ready to build. They had brought in things, adequate materials on Winter Road and they all went up in flames. So it delayed a lot. And it, but we're going to finish that house. It, it's taking, instead of 15 months, it's taking 12 mo uh, 18 months, but it's in the final stages now. And not easy to get materials up there when you don't have an ice road. And, and, and every, you know, even the CMHC need materials. So many of you said you wanted wood stoves. How we're going to heat is uh, with a wood stove and um, using infrared panels 
uh, which has considerable cost savings associated with it and provides kind of a dry heat. So we're going to put sensors in the house to see how that impacts moisture levels in the walls and humidity. So we'll be, mo uh, um, we'll be monitoring these over time and considering the, um, you can't see this, but this is the timeline of uh, Minobin Madison in the community and it looks at how in this community, really, because it's so remote, it was considered as remote as the North Pole because it doesn't have, uh, it's very, many portages to get there, that there's so much indigenous knowledge systems. The language is so alive in these communities. And so having community-led education helps keep that alive. So we're building capacity in homes with local materials and local labor. You can see them not only just building the house, but then learning how to use it with um, how to use, the, uh, use and maintain it at the very bottom. And looking at future designs for net zero, considering energy performance, passive solar, looking at uh, highly insulated, different, different you know, we, we still have some work to do, right? We're perfecting it, we're monitoring it, and we're gonna have a version two and version three. And no development project starts and doesn't monitor and evaluate and then goes back and rebuilds and rebuilds the same old nightmare, right? Which is the CMHC house. So we have to find a way to um, evaluate like any development project, like any project and improve time after time. And using the resources. The, uh, so Island Lake may be far north, but it has, it's considered by foresters to have some of the best wood in Manitoba. Um, comparable to Duck Mountain. So it's all, as you can see from the map, it's got lots of virgin forest and lots of the right forest for building. And 60 trees equal one house and we've got a pathway to do that and we're taking it from the forest all the way to the house. Everything can be done in the community with local labor. And community-led education and you can see them working away because of the, the shortage of materials. It brought us into winter to build, but they're out there every day. We're getting a perfect attendance in, for many students, and they're saying very positive things. This program is making lives better, even saving lives. So with the gangs, with the drug use, with the lack of opportunities, this is a lifesaver. Um, it's helping to improve skills, it's uh, teaching people social skills, teaching them how to build their own house. Many people are building shacks in their backyard and connecting it with wire, so how to do that and do it better, and developing good workers. The partnership grant uh, that I got through the university usually just goes to graduate students, but in this case, 80% is going to entry-level um, college students. So that can be done. We can, you can work with universities and colleges and do things differently and get them funding going to your community to build houses, to deal with the issues, to um, build capacity for your youth. Not, so hopefully by the, by the end of we'll, uh, this year, we'll have put a million dollars into these two communities into the hands of youth to, who are doing the buildings and building three houses in the communities. We've got, because it is kind of chaotic in these communities, we have one woman who started with us who is having her seventh child. So she's had to drop out. We had another woman who went on to interior design in university. So her goal is uh, interior design. But all of the people who join this program walk away with certificates and many certificates. So we don't want them to have to wait till 18 months to have something to show. If they've put in the work and earned something, we're continually giving them uh, certificates that shows they have capacity, that shows that uh, employers that they're worth hiring and uh, they're getting hired. And as well, just by teaching forestry and logging, they can go out into the community and there's always a good market to sell wood. So. It really does give, um, give resources, give skills to the people involved. 
we had two students who were part of the Boreal Home Building at, who did proposal writing with me. A number did, but two of them went on to, to win 550000 towards renovating their school. So, you know, you give these youths the opportunity, and they were phoning me. They had a workshop all day, and they would phone me to meet with me at 6 o'clock in the morning and then in the evening. So give them the chance and the opportunity, and they are there. I don't have any graduate students who do that. There was so much intent, and they wanted to provide and win this for their community, and they did. So now they're renovating their school, which is... Um, uh, they're just building a new school, and it was considered as being surplus and going to the landfill. Well, they saved that school. These two kids saved this school, and they learned proposal writing, and they were deathly, deathly afraid. Ro Roxanne is very, very shy. But they came out, and they won it. And the other aspect, though, is we're monitoring. I have a wise survey. I'm seeing these are at-risk youth. And uh, along with the national survey, we're looking at them and seeing over three years whether this program made a difference in their lives, right? Made a difference for income, for jobs, employment, for housing, for food security. And when we look at them right now, they're learning how to build houses. But in, this is for Wasagamak, a lot of them don't have suitable housing. So it's very important that they're doing this, and they're, they are giving the feedback. They know that they need to learn these skills, even for themselves, to build a house or build a shack. So this is an intervention, and I think it's an intervention that can be done in every community and should be done in every community. And it's taking the issues, and communities, First Nations communities, all communities have these issues, but never, you know, especially the remote communities are hard up for housing and have economic poverty and gangs, and few or no services. Like, Wasagamak doesn't even have a food store. It has to go take a boat to an island in order to get food. So that puts lots of people at risk during freeze up and break up. But they do have many positives. They have great language retention. So everyone speaks Anishinaabemowin or Odikri. They have great cultural wealth, strong indigenous knowledge systems, and a huge, they use actively their large traditional territories. So this action of community-led housing, partnerships, the sawmill company, so you're going to hear about this from other people, and many funding proposals, that's my job. I write funding proposals. That's my super uh, power. And uh, we're going to see the impacts, and we're already starting to see them. I think this is a step towards reconciliation in Minerva Madison, and it's giving hope to the communities, right? I make films, and I used to put hope in every one of my titles. And why? Because First Nations communities, especially the ones I'm working with, it was I just so hopeless. We needed some hope, right? Uh, for Lake St. Martin, that was flooded out for so many communities. So, and, and all the rest, the tradespeople, the education options, where many people feel they don't have any options. The funding is just not there. So this is a way to extend that funding because you don't have to fly people out. You don't have to house them out. You can pay them the dollars to stay in the community and build the houses. So in the end, we'll have fewer overcrowded houses. And now I'll pass the mic to Rihanna. Hello. So I use this. Hi. Um, uh, Tanse Supiko Sura Naskani Square and a Disney Kasin Kisi Bakmak Nitosin. Hi, my name is Blue Blanket Woman. My English name is Rihanna Morasti. I am Woodlands Cree from Barren Lands First Nation, which is a remote community off the shore of Reindeer Lake in northern Manitoba. Um, I am a first-year Master of Architecture student, and I hold an undergraduate degree in Environmental Design and Architecture at the University of Manitoba. Um, I am part of the Minopa Madizawin Partnership as a research assistant, and I'm develop along with Lancelot Kaur, who you've seen speak in that video. He's a professor at the Faculty of Architecture, and we have an architecture group, and I am in charge of developing a curriculum for the, fa with, for the Faculty of Architecture for um, 30 undergraduates, fourth year undergraduate students, 
and for um, graduate students from the Department of D Interior Design on housing in Wasaga Mac First Nation and Garden Hill First Nation. Um, so, oh, that's me. Um, so uh, I guess um, something that I want to talk about first is my own community. I, um, so how I got into this program, I guess. Uh, I grew up with my grandpa um, on the land. I grew up building log cabins until I was 14. I grew up um, on the islands of Reindeer Lake on my grandpa's fishing camp. Who is, uh, he's a commercial fisherman and a trapper and a hunter. And I've, that's how I lived for the first half of my life and got in, exposed to building and construction um, and I guess how I got into architecture. So as part of, as part of the partnership, um, one of the things that me and Shirley, I guess, were involved in was the, the development of the muskrat hut. So Alex, she, um, Shirley introduced Alex Wilson, who is the prof um, a professor for the University of Saskatchewan, and who developed the One House Many Nations campaign that, um, in a Pasquiat Cree Nation. So this was a product of uh, a two-day design workshop that dealt, dealt with housing, and we had for high school students come in for a workshop and draw out the house that would, that would be a custom for them. Um, so this muskrat hut uh, aims to address concerns about access to safe, clean, clean water, toilet and food preparation areas in remote areas. And it's a portable, um, I guess, toilet and shower. And I guess it's a smaller version of a product that could be reciprocated for housing design. Um, so, um, so I'm from Kisi Pakamak, which means where the water ends in Woodlands Cree, and it means that it's at the North Shore of Reindeer Lake in Northern Manitoba. That's, that's my dad. Um, he, he also raised me and lived uh, on Reindeer Lake in um, Northern Manitoba. Uh, so a lot of, this is actually the last time I was home. I've, uh, Broche, it's also called Broche in, in Berrylands First Nation. But um, the last time I was home was before I started my undergraduate degree, which is almost five years ago. So these photos are from that, and I helped my grandpa build uh, a log cabin for his fish camp. And this is the kind of process that I want to reciprocate um, in introducing these students to this to this type of design for First Nation communities. Um, a lot of the process dealt with us going to a, a whole separate island and transporting all the lumber on boat and by hand. And I remember as a kid, I used to, um, when I guess I wasn't strong enough, but uh, I remember as a kid, I used to just strip off the bark from my grandpa and just help in little ways um, as a kid. So, um, so in dealing with, I, I really want to, uh, focus on the hands-on approach that this, this type of building offers and we're focus on the process of design and planning and a lot of the there's three areas that I want to talk about I guess I already talked about one uh, was my own experience living out on the land and I guess what really helped me is the realization of the natural resources that these communities offer and how, to, how, how would you, I guess the main concern is how would you introduce these realities and harsh realities of these remote First Nation communities and these fly-in communities to students that have never experienced it themselves. Um, and I guess how, how would you introduce or introduce the issues that Shirley has talked so widely about. Um, and I want to focus on the teachings that my grandfather taught me um, from when I was younger and reciprocate those to the students that, were, that are going to be taking this course. Um, and the second part is um, the importance of community and relationships, um, how, developing a lens in the communities and how to work culturally um, and how would you in, do an integrated design process with these communities. Um, 
I think just overall, just listening, there's so much, these communities have so much knowledge um, to the place, from to the place, and they have knowledge of the resources, they have the knowledge of the tools, and they're, they have the capacity to participate um, in these design projects, in these construction projects, and all of this knowledge is based on sustainable, sustainable building. Um, I found it so weird that there was like, in, in design and architecture, there's this kind of um, section or specialty on sustainable building and green building, but for indigenous people, it's just, it was just second, it's second nature. It's inherent in us, and we have that knowledge to live sustainably, sustainably, and it shouldn't be its own separate topic. It should just be all something that works for the land and with the land. Um, and the next is on ecology, reciprocity, and the land. I truly believe that each region is specific in its materials and its local resources, and those local resources should be utilized. Um, and and a lot of our a lot of the indigenous worldview deals with the importance of Mother Earth and the land, and and these indigenous values are connected to the region and to the land, and that's something that I want to reciprocate. And in this development of the curriculum, there's this process that I want to take that in, in, in introducing these students, and that's tying the language and the land and all of those teachings that are within that are kind of, I guess, interconnected in some way. And the land and these teachings offer the local resources that can build these buildings. And the members have these have the local knowledge as well. And then the local resources could lead to the tools and then could lead to the construction of the building. Um, and what I really want to put emphasis on is, is, I guess, sustainable building and environmental design and focusing on the community's perspective on climate change as well. Um, the resources that these lands produce is sacred to indigenous people. And I think that's something that should be should be spoken more about and um, integrated into, into these processes. Because um, as, as, an, as indigenous people, like, like I said, it's inherent, it's in our blood, it's in our bodies, and that's something that I want to um, have these students be more knowledgeable about, and that this inherent way of being is our reflection of our stewardship to the land. And I guess um, overall I want these uh, I want the work to be grounded in this um, integrated design process and with the knowledge of ecology and uh, the surrounding landscape and all the, all the local resources that are available within the surrounding communities and also focusing on the, voice, the voices of these communities which is really important because they, they're willing to learn, they're willing to be part of these projects and make a difference within these communities. And overall, um, I guess final, these, um, that these students would provide the, the designs um, for, for these communities and for, these, uh, for the Minnipoma Desuin Partnership and for these uh, building um, programs within Wasagamac. So. I think that's all. Oh yeah, and uh, Daryl Westesikut. Westesikut. Okay. Good afternoon, or good morning. Is it still morning? <clears throat> My name is Daryl Westesikut. I'm from York Factory First Station, way up north in uh, northern Manitoba. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, growing up in a small community of, say, 400 people back then, there was no jobs. There was <clears throat> usually when your your youth 
at home, you pretty much have to be uh, maybe related to the chief and council to get a job, but we were pretty much outcasts. So, but I ended up going to residential school in Dauphin, in Manitoba from the age of uh, seven years old to 14. I actually ran away from the residential school there and the closest city that I could think of was Winnipeg and I heard a lot about it so that's where I went. So I lived on the streets of Winnipeg for about five years and I ended up wanting to go home later on and I was just lonely. So I went home, <clears throat> I actually got a job in construction for the first time and since then I've, I've been in it. I've been in the construction industry for about 38 years now and in the beginning when I left home I couldn't get a job, nobody would hire me. So for about five months I couldn't get a job anywhere in the city. So I, I was just that, what am I going to do? How am I going to get a, how am I going to uh, support myself out here. So I said, well, I'll go up to a, any company. I'll say, I'll work for free for a week. If, if I do good, you hire me. So that's what I did. And it worked out. They hired me because they knew I was going to get up, work for free for a bit. But it, it really did work out. <clears throat> uh, that's where I got my start. I My first project was, my first uh, real schooling was uh, I wanted to be a welder and I did get end up getting my ticket but back in the 80s there was no real work in the welding industry. So I turned to carpentry and I did my first level, second level, third level but <clears throat> these big projects came like uh, the Manitoba Hydro had uh, dams going up. So I worked on three major dams in, in, in my lifetime. And the racism that you could experience in these big projects were, were just just overwhelming. And I almost quit so many times in these projects. So as a youth, I had a, we ha I had a lot of challenges. And I just had to keep on going and, and not pay attention, not pay so much attention to what people say about me and how we live. So it's been a long road to, to even get here. I ended up, my last project, my last big project was the Kias Dam in uh, northern Manitoba. It's actually still being built. It was, it's a 740 kilowatt dam which is probably about a quarter of a kilometer long when you think about it that that's how big the structure is and there was not there was part of the part of the uh, part of part of the uh, contract was they would hire uh, native people they'd ha they have to and that didn't work out the the main contractor just and uh, found ways to get rid of us and they brought in their workers wherever they came from but the the reason why I'm, I'm touching more on the racism is because it's still happening in our communities when when contractors come to our communities they still do that to us in, in our own communities they still get rid of us they still bring their own workers in and I was actually working for a contractor while I was in Wasagamac. That's where I went with a contractor. And out there, uh, we, I, I was a supervisor for, for a company from Manitoba and I built like, I'm more into uh, commercial buildings like, like schools and arenas and, and just big structures. Uh, but I did a lot of housing back bef when I started and now I'm back to the housing. But prior to this, I was working for Manitoba Hydro and I could not stay with that company that did nothing about the racism. So I left. <clears throat> so I, I got back to 
the smaller uh, structures, which is housing. Uh, I was actually supposed to be uh, building more stuff for that other company, but I got fired because I stuck up for the locals. So you can see where that goes in the communities. I actually really got fired from the, the company that I was working for in Wasagamack. It actually happened in Wasagamack. So that's because I was protecting the local uh, labor and the way they were being treated. But uh, I, I found another job right away in the city. But uh, the, a company called Anna Q and Training uh, called me and said, please don't take that job yet. Don't take the job and just hear me out, hear us out. And so I ended up back in Wasagamack because that's where the project ended up being. So I, the, the job was to, to train young people to, to build uh, structures. And that's my specialty. I've been a carpenter for 34 years, and then I went back to school and I became an engineering, a construction engineer uh, tech out of uh, Alberta. So my main goal in, in starting with the this program was to, to teach the youth how to build. Not just to build, but how to live with uh, dealing with construction sites and what to expect, how, how to deal with them. And in Wasagamack, well, basically in the whole Island Lake, there's gangs there. There's a lot of gang activities in these communities. but. It extended out to Winnipeg. This, this gang is one of the biggest gangs in Manitoba. They're called, uh, oh, I'm not going to say any names, but it, it ended up being one of the biggest gangs in, the, in, in Manitoba, a, a youth native gang. And they extend out to Winnipeg, even past Winnipeg, but these, are, these three communities in the Island Lake area were the most affected because they were literally uh, killing each other and we I had to figure out how to integrate construction with the youth and most of the youth that I've been dealing with in, in the Island Lake area have no education or something none at all so I had a curriculum with me when I started to, uh, teaching the the students. Two days into the curriculum, I threw it away. Couldn't do it. So I had to figure out how to teach these kids how to build. So I thought that you need at least a great tent to, to be a carpenter. That's, that's basically what the province says. And there is no great ten there. there. There's a few that did graduate, but they didn't end up with uh, the best uh, education because of the First Nation not having adequate education there. So having a grade 12 uh, status in the, in the community doesn't mean anything. It's just because of how uh, education doesn't really apply its uh, curriculum like they do in the cities. It's different, it's very different. They, they, they don't learn uh, even half of what they're supposed to. So a grade 12 out there was more like a grade nine. So I had to deal with, with uh, 20 students that had no, next to no education. And so I figured out a way to, to do it. So I'd have a class every morning for two hours on how to build a house right for, from the bottom up. So we would prep the site. So we would, I would teach them about pre prepping the site and then we would actually go onto the site with Larry and we would prep the site. After the prep is done, we would go back to the classroom and we would start the footing. I would teach them about the footing, how, how to quantify, 
how to do everything ab about the footing, and then we go out and do it. So this was working. This, they were retaining everything that we were teaching them. And because the community had no lumber, uh, there was a fire uh, prior to this uh, project starting, so they lost everything. And they, they still have nothing. I don't, think, I don't even think the trucks came in yet. Did they come in yet with new lumber? They, they were, we were scraping. There's communities that were, there's a community next door that had a, a, a little bit of lumber yard. So we would go purchase there and, and just to continue the, uh, the project. But the students kept on coming. They, they didn't give up. They, they were interested enough to, to try and change their lifestyles. And most, I'd say probably out of the 20, there's probably about 15 that were gang members. So, and these are used from, from 15 to, to 45 years old. So they're not just youth, they're actually adults in this gang that, that sort of manipulate the youth. So we had to try and figure out a way to get the youth to, to be a part of the community, not, not to be against it. So it was uh, challenging. It's still challenging. There's a lot more to be done with the youth, but they have a lot, learned a lot from the way that I had to teach them. So Larry is, is the on-site uh, carpenter that teaches them on-site. I'm the one that teaches them in the, in the classroom. So. It, it's working. It's really, it's, it's really, really, really working. The youth sometimes get frustrated because we, we run short of materials because there are none. So when they're not active, they sort, of try, so they sort of slip away, so we have to try and get them back some way, but they do come back. And there's a lot more youth that want to get involved in this program. And, and it's, it's going to go a, a, a long ways for the community. And I'm not only working with Wasagamac, I'm working with uh, other communities doing the same thing, and it is working. So having youth build the homes and tackling more than just one issue is, is the goal here. So I'd encourage everybody that, that has, has the same problems to, to look at different ways to, to solve the issues. It may not solve the issues, but it is making a dent in, in, in the way the youth think now. So there's a lot more that want to get involved in the program now that they see that the, other, the ones that are in it now, they're, they actually have a structure up. We did none of the work. We just showed them how to do it. They did all the work. They built their own trusses. They built everything themselves. And that's what gives them the drive to try and live a better life. So I, I'd say to the government and the First Nation uh, uh, Band Council to focus more on the youth, and that way you're going to get a better person in your community, one, one person at a time. So thank you for letting me uh, speak today. It, it, this is just the beginning for me. And I'm liking it. I'm used to the big projects, but this one's bigger for me. Thank you. And Larry. <laughs> Hello, good morning. Um, <clears throat> when I was asked to, uh, if I wanted to attend the housing conference, I said yes. I didn't expect to be speaking at this event. <laughs> I'm uh, <clears throat> honored to be, to be here at this uh, event, uh, this housing conference. Um, let me start by saying that I'm the manager for Mitte Corp. It's a Business entity of uh, Wasigmak First Nation. Uh, 
And it will be an independent contracting firm operating on reserve. I've been with them um, in the housing trade for uh, 30 years. I started off um, right after uh, high school. I started my apprenticeship trade in the carpentry program. So uh, <clears throat> there was like 45 of us in the in Island Lake area that started off with the program. And by year five, or, there was only five of us that finished the program. So there's challenges uh, trying to get um, skilled trades in, in any reserve. Uh, but I was fortunate that uh, I had uh, support from my family to uh, finish this uh, training program. The First Nation has a uh, capital project in the housing program. And Mitika will work with uh, the housing program on construction project as a subcontractor. So, during my um, apprenticeship uh, trade, uh, when we were building houses on, on our reserve, um, we usually had to wait a long time to have other <clears throat> have other uh, sub trades come to our community. So our housing housing construction took longer, and that's one of the reasons why I uh, after I finished my carpentry uh, trade, uh, I, I uh, took it upon myself to get into electrical trade too, because you know, no, nobody else was doing it at that, at that time. Which, which is good, because um, uh, we, we, don't, we don't have to wait for um, outside contractors to come in to uh, wire up our houses. Uh, uh, we, could, we, we could do that ourselves. So, with this uh, Mitte company, it was established to engage our youth and uh, get them involved with uh, a meaningful on-the-job training. It is to provide opportunities for any youth that wants to pursue a career in the trades. When I uh, look around in my own reserve, I see uh, children playing, youth walking around. Uh, during uh, school hours, and when I see that, I feel bad for our youth, and I say, uh, "Why aren't they in uh, school?" Uh, someone asked me once, um, "How can we motivate our youth to get a, a good education?" I was stumped and uh, I thought hard and I couldn't uh, answer that question because I needed more time to think about the, the question itself. It is a frame of mind on, on an individual. We need to show the youth that uh, they matter. There are better avenues that they can take to for a better future and for themselves and their children. That drugs and alcohol shouldn't have to control their actions. Every community has its fair share of uh, social problems and challenges. Our community is isolated. We don't have a, an airport and so the cost of living is higher and uh, we have a high rate of unemployment. When you consider these factors, uh, the t decisions people make about their finances is uh, over a choice between paying for rent on their houses or, or to put food on the table. They will buy food.
Meta is uh, Meta company is is not to give a false sense of impression that uh, we have a solution to solve our housing crisis, but to alleviate <coughs> overcrowding and hardship that our young people are facing. It is to give our young couples starting out with their lives a, me a meaning, a house to call home. And if we can build one or two houses each year with this uh, sawmill business, um, then it's a start. We do have a um, housing shortage in our community. And young couples, that they uh, tend to take every, every uh, space available in houses that, uh, that are available and they put a, a wall to separate the two families. And oftentimes uh, those houses are so dilapidated that uh, it's very hard to keep the house warm. Some of them don't have uh, running water. Like uh, <clears throat> my daughter and her husband and their uh, one-year-old child has to come to my house because their house is so cold that uh, it's so it's hard to heat the heat the house. So that's one of my my main focus uh, with uh, starting this uh, mythic uh, corp mythic business uh, mythic corporation is to at least give these young couples a chance to start their lives off. And uh, I think that's uh, all I can say about it. So we have time for questions, I think. I just want to mention that how many of your communities have apprenticeship in the schools? Raise your hands. So this could be a game changer. I don't know why it's not happening in First Nations Reserves. It should be happening. They should be learning in grade nine with that supervision. Uh, I hear uh, Adam Knott, the director of education, is touring W.B. Russell, so it's a vocational school in Winnipeg, and saying, we need this in our community. This would retain a lot of people. It would build tradespeople. It would, re it would make sure people have an education. So work with your province and get that into your community. And maybe then in the future we won't be saying apprenticeship is the mafia and it's keeping First Nations people out. But right now, until this happens, it really... That's what people are saying. That's what Ovid Mercredi said to me yesterday, right? So let's change that. Let's get the government on board getting apprenticeship into the schools. And I'll just let you know that um, the business plan for Matik is up online. If you check out Mina Bimanadiswin, you can see it. The grants that we get are up online. So we want to make all this information available for you, if you want a businesses in your community, if you want sawmills in your community, if you want to write proposals, there's examples out there and there's expertise here and there's, we also have the designs online. So this is something that I think is, is an opportunity and has to happen in many communities. Many communities want this, it's just hard finding a pathway and finding the expertise. So we're making it freely available. It's just check the Mina by Madison Partnership um, website, okay? And we're open for questions if you have any, if we have time, that is. I can answer a little bit of that. In, 
in Island Lake, there's <clears throat> they have been sawing uh, for quite a while now. Most of it is most of the people that are, are saw milling are, are it's on their own. But since this program started, uh, they have brought in uh, uh, graders to come and look at our lumber, and they've made. Uh, they actually took a, a semi-trailer, emptied it, and stored the wood in there, stored it, uh, uh, piled it so the air could flow through it. And so it was actually the, uh, a, a semi-trailer, enclosed semi-trailer that they use as a kiln. And it, it takes a little bit longer, but it's in an open area where the f there are holes in in, in this uh, structure, in the semi-trailer. So air does flow through, uh, the sun does heat it up inside, so that's their kiln. And it, it works, uh, I think they got lumber up to about 19%. <clears throat> um, I think most of the lumber that you get from from the, the uh, the building suppliers are about 11 to 15, so they're pretty close. And the, the lumber that they do use is not uh, nominal size, it's, it's mostly actual size. If a two by four is a two by four. And we found that it's a lot stronger, like back in, in the early 18, uh, 1900s in Winnipeg, most of the houses are built out of that. And they're still standing. So why not do the same thing? Like, and the other thing is harvesting trees from the local area, the trees live there, so they're, actually, they're gonna do better than a tree that comes from BC. So there, there's a lot of factors to, to, to look at when you're saw milling in here. So you gotta almost actually bring that science to it, which, uh, uh, University of Manitoba was able to uh, help with. So it is totally possible. And as part of the education program, we bring a grader up to teach all the students how to grade and what to look for in wood. And when he's there, he grades it. So we get the stamp on the wood. And they, you know, there are problems, and we actually do have to petition this. Is how uh, sawmill grading is developed, it's for industrial straw sawmills. So you need a certain amount cut every year to retain that uh, license. It, that shouldn't occur. So, you know, there should be room for community sawmills where we're not shipping and exporting to the states, right? And we have to ask, or, you know, make that request of government because this uh, preventing boreal um, people in the boreal from using their own wood to build and use the money for CMHC and other things is just wrong. So yes, it, it's two things. We can use the graders and, uh, that are available, that come from the big industrial mills to, get our, to teach our students, but then we have to petition government to actually change those unjust rules. And do the students become certified they, they do, but to maintain that, they, like, it, it, they don't have the stamp. They can't maintain the stamp because it costs a certain amount of money and we don't have the volume. The, it's an industrial amount of volume that has to be petitioned. But we did get the, the stamp for Island Lake. So there, there are ways to do this and every year we can teach grading and re-educate people and get them to um, stamp all the wood. So you just do that at the end of the drying process and then you use that for your build. This year, it was unfortunate with the fire, but in future years, we expect to get 60 to 70% of the volume of houses made by local wood. Wouldn't that be amazing for, for the environment, for local economy? It'll stop the leaky bucket and the money will stay in the community. And we can use the siding, we can use paneling, no drywall, we don't need drywall, it only causes troubles. Um, so there's a lot of flooring that can be done with local wood. All right, so that's uh, 12.14 now. 
So um, if you guys can fill out on the app, if you guys do have the app, fill out the feedback. You guys go on the app, and then you guys go click on the session, this session, the Boreal Forest. You guys can click on the rate button, then it shows um, just feedback on the presentation you guys just witnessed here. Um, if you don't have the app, there's papers in the front there that you guys can fill out by hand, and that'd be pretty good. So um, I have speaker gifts for the speakers here. So I have one for Shirley. It's a blanket. Thank you so much. I have one for Rihanna.